be in the Gospel of John this morning, beginning some messages leading up uh, to our Easter message, all of which will be out of the Gospel of John. So if you would like to turn to John, John chapter 12, you can see our text or you can follow along uh, on the screen. By way of introduction, I, I want to make mention of something that, something that I have noticed personally. These are four examples of people in my life and the way in which they approach God, the way in which they worship, the way in which they, they feel comfortable with God. I'm going to start with my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law has taken up a, a new hobby in recent years that is an interesting one. And it's actually very time-consuming and rather expensive when you put the materials in it, and that is the making of icons. And we don't know much about icons here, but icons are big in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's a religious art form dating back nearly 2,000 years. It allows her to express her love of God with the work of her hands. Contrast that with my grandfather, my dad's dad, who was fond of attending worship services that had a lot more excitement and enthusiasm in them than I can feel comfortable being a part of. He enjoyed that kind of thing. My wife, on the other hand, finds solace in the elaborate rituals and the solemnity of the Catholic Mass. And those of you who know me well know that I seem most comfortable sitting in a room with a Bible open in front of me doing an impromptu Bible study. Very different in our approaches, in, in what we do to feel a connection to God. So keep that in mind today, and that's probably reflected in many of you here this morning, that diversity. Keep that in mind as we look at Mary in chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. Let's begin then with the first verse. The first verse says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This is six days before the Passover. This is when we know that the time of fulfillment for the mission and purpose of Jesus is now at hand. All along, Jesus has been preparing for this upcoming week. He has been training his disciples. He has been teaching the people all over Israel with the notion that there was a time limit on his ministry. He had this much time but no more. On several occasions, Jesus actually delayed the enthusiasm of the crowds when they wanted to make him king by force. And on other occasions, he had to thwart the anger of a different crowd because of his teachings, because his time was not yet at hand. But now, with Passover only a week away, that conclusion is in sight. All of the prophecies of old about the Messiah, all the predictions that Jesus himself has made about his death and resurrection are about to be borne out. The symbolism of the sacrifice of the Christ has to be connected with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So when the Passover is approaching, now is the time. The religious leaders of Israel, whether Pharisees or Sadducees or members of the Sanhedrin, have long looked for an excuse and an opportunity to arrest and do away with Jesus and crush his movement. We saw that in the text we read earlier today. They have been looking for this opportunity. By going to Jerusalem for the feast, Jesus will merely let them have their way at long last. But before he gets there, Jesus is in Bethany. This is a small village a few miles away from Jerusalem. It is close enough that Jesus can make the final portion of the journey for Palm Sunday that next day. He can enter in triumph into Jerusalem from a short distance away. But there was another reason why Jesus chose this particular village as the last stop on his road to Jerusalem. It was where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. It was the home of three of Jesus' friends, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. If you yourself knew that the days ahead would be the most difficult by far of your life, wouldn't you want to spend an evening 
among loved ones, remembering the good times, celebrating the good things before that began. It was also the scene of Jesus' greatest triumph today, his victory over death when he returned life to Lazarus. Jesus himself now faced the uncertainty of death. He had the promise of his Father. That was a promise Jesus knew he could rely upon. But faith is something we don't mind having bolstered, even when it is already strong. It doesn't hurt us at all to have a little bit of extra faith. And here we see Jesus eating dinner with Lazarus, the very proof in front of his faith, in front of his face, that God is not limited by death. That as the giver of life, God can raise the dead to new life. So with a cross on the horizon, seeing Lazarus' smiling face must have been a comfort to the heart and mind of Jesus. Continue with verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. We have three people mentioned here at the dinner. At the dinner, the first is the guest of honor, Jesus himself. It's no surprise at all that Martha, Mary, and Lazarus would want to hold a dinner in Jesus' honor. After all, he did recently raise one of them from the dead. If that doesn't earn you a nice honorary spaghetti dinner, I don't know what does. You're raised from somebody from the dead. You deserve an honorary dinner, I think. I say spaghetti dinner because that's our favorite thing. Anytime there's a fundraiser, anytime there's a celebration, spaghetti! We see it on some church signs as you drive up and down the highway. As their rabbi, as their teacher, as their messiah, Jesus is honored by his friends and by his followers. It's an honor that his status as the Son of God entitles him to. And it is an honor that his demonstrated compassion as the Son of Man has earned for him. You see, Jesus never sought out the applause of the crowd. That's not why he is here. He could have easily been rich and powerful and famous with his ability to work miracles. But that temptation was one that Jesus spurned long ago when he told Satan to take a hike when it was offered to him. And yet Jesus appreciates, as we all do, the honor and the affection that comes from those who know you best. These are his friends. Their love will still support Jesus when they themselves are not physically able to stand by his side in the upcoming trials. So we have the guest of honor. And we have the busy bee. It must have been Martha's personality type to be the hostess. She was apparently a rather practical woman who made sure that things were done that needed to be done. Now some of you sitting here today may feel a kinship with Martha. You feel just like Martha. When things need to be organized, when things need to be planned, you're the one to call. You love that stuff. You thrive on it. We need people like Martha, or things here wouldn't get done. But Mary will soon show us that being practical isn't the only path in life. And lastly, we have the mystery man. Imagine how much attention Lazarus received from everyone. At our retreat in May, we'll hear from Don Piper, the author of 90 Minutes in Heaven. Now that is an impressive duration, but well short of Lazarus's record. Lazarus was dead for four days before Jesus raised him to new life. He was in the tomb. It was long past the time when he might have been miraculously saved, or so everyone thought, until Jesus came. Now look at him. Can you imagine Lazarus doing anything other than smiling all the time? He literally has a second chance at life. Another chance to savor all of its joys, all of its goodness. Another chance to make a difference with the way that he spends his life. Let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
We see Mary's act of devotion, and she does this with a very expensive gift. There may have been other cheaper alternatives, other oils or perfumes that cost less than this for Mary to use in this situation that would have still shown that she felt devoted to Jesus, a cheaper way to do this. Yet it seems like that wasn't an option for Mary. The only proper way to express what her heart felt was to go beyond the ordinary to the extraordinary. It probably took Mary years to save up the money to make this purchase. We have no idea where she got that money from and how much, what she sold or what she did, how she earned it. But the pure nard she poured out on Jesus' feet this day was the opposite of a practical decision. It was an extravagant choice. And not only the gift itself, but the way in which she, re she applied it was memorable. The gift itself may have been extravagant, yet the way in which Mary put this perfume on Jesus' feet elevated her act of devotion to the level of the sublime. She put herself into the offering as well. By wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, Mary shows that she will hold nothing back in her effort to show Jesus how much honor and admiration and worship and love she feels toward her Messiah. If it was just the perfume, or it was just the washing with her hair, it would have been an eye-opening example on its own. We remember what Mary did this very day because she offered both to God. In addition, something you may not know, there was a cultural taboo against Jewish women letting down their hair in public. This then is yet another layer to the picture of how far Mary was willing to go. It didn't matter to her that other people would have disapproved, nor did, it, did she care if she was the only one going, willing to go this far. Her heart desired to respond to God's goodness to her with an over-the-top outpouring of devotion. So that's exactly what Mary did. Let's see what everyone else thought about. Verses 4 through 6. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And here we have rising in opposition the voice of practicality. There would have been some who were scandalized by Mary's actions on that cultural level. For a woman to publicly touch the feet of a rabbi and wash them with her hair likely raised more than a few eyebrows. But right alongside the objection on the grounds of propriety is the objection on the basis of practicality. This perfume was expensive, extravagantly so. In a strict sense, Jesus didn't need to have this done to him or for him. It was a luxury, plain and simple. The question then becomes, how can anyone justify a luxury when so many necessities are being unsatisfied? There are far needier causes, far more desperate people. How can Mary have been so wasteful? Now we know from our text that there is a hidden motive with Judas. But that does not change the debate when we are talking about practical versus lavish. To know that Judas' objection was a self-serving one does not change it. The question still remains to be answered, and we will let Jesus answer it himself in just a moment. Until then, it suffices to know that Judas was not the only one thinking that at this moment. If you look at Matthew's account, Matthew makes it clear that multiple disciples were echoing Judas's words. Judas just had a, a secondary motive, his own greed, that caused him to pipe up and actually say what everyone else was thinking. Let us for a moment assume that both sides in the debate hold their opinions through heartfelt convictions. 
Those who side with Mary are firmly convinced that devotion should God to, to God should not be a matter of cost. And those who side with the disciples are just as firmly convinced that need must always outweigh sentiment. Now, I don't think this is likely to be an issue that divides us by gender. The men are practical, the women are sentimental, or vice versa. I don't think that's what it is at all. I think this has a lot more to do with your personality type, with the type of personality you have, and with your personal history, the road that you have walked down in life. So is one side right and the other wrong here, or are they both right? Let's look at Jesus' response to get some insight into this issue. Verse 7, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus begins by saying, leave her alone. This is what God intended for Mary to do at this time and in this place. There certainly were other worthy causes to which the cost of this perfume may have been applied. But Jesus defended Mary's use of it for this purpose, as an act of gratitude, as an act of devotion, as an act of love. It was suitable for that purpose. There are times when the question of cost cannot be the deciding factor. Times when we must shut off the practical side of our nature and indulge the side that dreams big. If we can't access that level of hope-fueled passion towards God, the God in whom we trust to save our very souls, when will we? That we find the time, the energy, the money to indulge ourselves usually doesn't bother us at all. So why should we or anyone be bothered with someone's exceptional devotion to God? Jesus explained to them that this is in preparation for his burial. Now, if you had a choice between two options, which would you choose? On the one hand, you can offer up to God personally a chance to worship the Son of God and give back a small portion of what has been given to you. Or on the other hand, there's a separate line where you can address some worthy goal, where you can deal with a need that we have a responsibility towards. Those are the two choices. Either Mary could have used this for Jesus, or she could have given it for the cause of the poor. No, I'm not attempting here to elevate devotion over service. Simply a reminder to us that our service is ultimately in the name of Jesus. If our service to others is to be made complete, if it is to be made full, we must ourselves approach God in humble acts of worship. We cannot simply serve. We must also worship. They are both necessary. For Mary, her own interaction with Jesus led her to make this gesture in gratitude. In the will of God, what she did of her own volition served a higher purpose as well. It eased the burden of the path ahead in the mind of Jesus. You see, by dreaming, instead of keeping her feet firmly planted on the ground, Mary made a difference to Jesus. Let me look at verse 8 once again. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. I think this really illustrates the difference between our duties and our obligations and the opportunities that we find along the way. Jesus said, you will always have the poor among you. And contrary to what some people may wish to believe, this is not an excuse given, us, given to us by Jesus that allows us to ignore the poor. This is not Jesus saying, hey, the poor are always going to be there, so why even bother trying? It won't make a difference. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus means when he says these words. Jesus is saying that because the causes of poverty are endemic to the fallen state of humanity, there can be no overall cure. We cannot 
cure poverty. But there can be individual or family or even community success stories, just not universal ones. Therefore, our obligation, and it is an obligation, as children of a kind and loving God, will always be to care for the poor. The opportunity for us to obey God in this matter and help those in need will continue to be there each and every day. You see, we may need to dream big to find solutions to such an intractable problem. How do we make a difference with poverty? Believe me, it is no small thing to come up with an effective solution. But we don't need to look very far to find the problem. It's all around us. It's here in Franklin. It's here in Venango County. You do not have to go to the third world to find poverty and people in need. We will always have the opportunity to fulfill that obligation. But Jesus says, you will not always have me. In contrast to our daily opportunities to serve others as we should, the chances we have for the type of devotion offered by Mary will be fewer. They're certainly still there, and we can find them, but we must actually seek them out. We must look for them. If Mary had ignored the cry of her heart to do this, to do this here and to do this now, the chance would have passed her by. This was the only chance for her to do this. She could have offered her thanks to God at any other point. She could have done something else to show her gratitude to God. But the chance to kiss the feet of the Son of God would not present itself again. So Mary seized the moment. She ignored the cautionary voice of common sense and the disapproving looks of others, and she worshipped Jesus. We need to be like Mary. How can we show God our gratitude and our devotion? I actually think we are in an interesting place theologically as a Baptist church. Because ours is not the tradition filled with liturgy and sacred ritual. We don't have a rosary to pray. We don't have stations of the cross to do. And I am certainly not walking up and down the aisle waving back and forth incense. That's not happening here. On the other hand, ours is also not the tradition filled with emotional outpourings. We don't dance in the aisle. We don't raise our hands and shout hallelujah. And when we try to clap along to a song, it never looks pretty. Trust me, we're not good at it. We struggle. See, we're Northern Baptists. Those Southern Baptists, they know how to do that, but we don't. We're uncomfortable, either with the Catholic Orthodox style of ritual or the Pentecostal style of exuberance. So where does that leave us? How do we give to God the honor and worship that he is due if we're not comfortable with ritual and we're not comfortable with the passion? Where does that leave us? It's actually a good question. <laughs> it leads us to the place where we can find our own way. You see, Mary wasn't following the example of anybody else. She was following her heart. She went out on a to a place open to public ridicule if she was wrong. Imagine what would have happened if Jesus would have said, Don't! Oh, cut that out! It would have been ruined. But she felt compelled to do this. There was nothing contrived about this. There was nothing fake about this. She needed to do this for Jesus. And so she found a way. See that attitude that Mary had, that attitude of love toward God, that attitude of willingness to pay the price when necessary, that attitude of being willing to take a risk if you have to, that should be our guide when we follow our heart. You see, if your heart is telling you to say amen, then say it. If your heart is telling you to sit quietly, on the other hand, in the sanctuary on some Tuesday morning to pray, then do that. If your heart is burdening you, to give of your time, or your talent, or your treasure, then that is what you are supposed to do. It doesn't matter to me if it's in song. It doesn't matter to me if it's in praying, or if you write something, or if you draw, 
Or if you build something, it doesn't matter what talent or what ability or lack thereof you use to worship God. Give it to God. Do not quench the prompting of the Holy Spirit when God moves your heart to an act of devotion to Him. And when you are following your heart, don't count the cost. The cost will always be more than the tight-fisted amongst us are comfortable with. Don't listen to that impulse. Give generously in devotion to Christ, and it will never be wasted. Pray as long as you need to. Sing as loud as you want. Let others worry about what people are thinking of them. You focus on the worship that God deserves for saving your soul. And then lastly, dare to dream. You know, most of the things that we fail to do in life were defeated long before we even tried them. Because we didn't believe. We didn't really hope. That's not good enough for God. We have no shortage of resources here. We have no lack of power. We have no doubt of the final victory. Open your eyes to the possibilities. See the wonders God is already doing through His servants and in His mighty power. And join in on the celebration of the victory over the grave that we will soon commemorate on Easter morning. It only took a simple girl who ignored the cost, pushed past the people that would snicker, and embraced the opportunity to serve her Lord, to show us the value of devotion to Jesus. Don't let Mary's example be wasted. Find your own way to worship Jesus.